Great. Okay, welcome everybody and welcome to those of you who are joining us online today as well. Um, this is the Environmental Communication Seminar and the Program on the Environment at the University of Washington. We've got a fantastic speaker here in week eight of our program. This is Samara Amante, Executive Director and Producer of Races Verdes. And the, the seminar today will focus on her work as a storyteller addressing environmental justice and uplifting the voices of Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Um, I, uh, I want to just remind everyone, if you have questions at any time today, uh, folks online, you can raise your little digital hand or you can type your questions into the chat. Um, our guests will speak for about 30 minutes or so, and then uh, we'll jump into some questions from the audience. So folks here, please uh, feel free to ask your questions. Then folks online, you can uh, go ahead and raise your little digital hand and feel free to ask your questions out loud or you can just type those into the chat. So uh, before I go any further, I wanna go ahead and introduce our guest today. Samara Amante is part of the Michoacan diaspora and grounds her multimedia storytelling work in decolonial frameworks that uplift indigenous people's self-determination. Samara is the producer and creative director of Reces Verdes, that's Green Roots, a multimedia platform dedicated to uh, archiving and sharing the experiences of Black, Indigenous, people of color across diasporic experiences and reconnecting with their green roots. Green roots here are defined as our ancestral connection to the earth that embodies our relationship with all living and spiritual beings. Samara received a BA in Urban Planning and sustainable, su Sustainability Development with a specialization in Environmental Justice and Education from Western Washington University. Go Vikes, I was also yeah. <laughs> Western uh, alum. Samara is also a 2018-2019 Doris Duke Conservation Scholars Program alumni from the University of Michigan. Samara Lente's presentation is titled Storytelling Rooted in Self-Determination for the Earth and People. Let's go ahead and welcome her. So let me see if I can get this. Thank you. Well, thank you again, Sean, for reaching out. I really appreciate being here. Um, it was funny, I was just like tweeting before this. I was like, I don't know how like people see me when I do college presentations, but I feel like I just graduated, but it's been a couple of years now. You know, the pandemic just like changed our whole perception of time. But I'm really excited and hope that anything that I heard today can really just inspire y'all's own journey with environmental communications and to really think about how environmental justice intersects with all of that. Um, so I'm really speaking from my own journey, my own perspective. I really hope that this presentation doesn't feel like it's like the be all of how environmental justice communication should be approached or environmental justice storytelling. But again, this is just my one perspective as a reconnecting indigenous woman living in diaspora. My family is from the state of Michoacan, Mexico, and we've been living here in the Pacific Northwest or Coast Salish territory for over like a dozen or yeah, over like 12 years, maybe like 15 now. Um, so definitely place-based knowledge now here in Washington state, but I still very much hold um, the lessons and, and knowledge that I've been given from my community back home. Um, and oh, outside of uh, this multimedia work I do, um, we were just kind of talking before with the TAs about like internships and placements. I, if you're interested in also learning more about kind of local grassroots work, I work for the Environmental Coalition of South Seattle or ECOS, E-C-O-S-S. -S. I'm a senior project manager there. Somehow I'm doing both, like creative work and a full-time job. Um, but yeah, that's so if you have questions about ECOS, I'm also more than happy to share about the work we do there because um, it's all very much connected and led me there as well. Um, so with that, I will share first a little bit more about Raices Verdes. So um, Sean, you know, shared a little bit of the description. So again, Raices Verdes is a multimedia platform. Um, it started when I was a student at Western Definitely used my capstone class to come up with it because I was like, okay, like I don't have time, so I'm doing this class. And it started out as a podcast. I really just wanted to document um, the stories of like my peers. You know, I would see a few students of color here and there, and then especially when I um, went to the Doris Duke Conservation Scholars Program at the University of Michigan, that is a program for students of color to get placed in internships and um, 
get just like some uh, like mentorship of working in the environmental field. And I was like, you know, with cohort of students of color, I was also working under um, an OG, like environmental scholar, uh, Doris, um, Dorsita Taylor, Dr. Dorsita Taylor, got to put the doctor on there because she was the first black woman to graduate from the Yale forestry program. So she was like a badass woman. Um, and so she, you know, she was like our mentor there in that program. And so being part of all that space is like these really awesome black women in the environmental field with other students of color, it made me realize like we need a platform for us to like document our story, document our research, because if you look at the majority of like environmental media, whether it's podcasting or TV or anything else, um, it is primarily still white centered. And so that's how it started. It just started as like a little like DIY podcast, right? This was like in 2019. And then I graduated from college and stuff just kept evolving and I kept finding myself being finding this path of storytelling and and also like as I reconnected with my indigenous ancestry realizing like storytelling is part of the work that my ancestors and my elders would like for me to do to again archive these stories right and I'll get a little bit more into why archiving is so important. And then, you know, the name I gave this podcast or this platform Green Roots or Races Verdes, again it just really comes to this idea that no matter really what identity we hold and where we live in this world, I think we all have a green root, just like how we have our roots to like our people, our ancestors, our parents. We also have roots that go deep into the environment, right? We all have historically had relationships with the environment, but because of things like capitalism and just urbanization, right, we get disconnected from the environment from day to day. And I think if anything, we're trying to go back to the connection, right? Like when you look at all the green, I mean, you know, I'm also an urban planning nerd. So I look at like the green infrastructure that they're trying to implement in like urban spaces. It's definitely a way that I can see us trying to revert back to having a connection to nature in everyday life. Um, and then, yeah, the four pillars that I kind of been working on with Raices Verdes, both with the podcast and then with the other multimedia, which has been like writing and video, which I'll also share some examples, has been really thinking about self-determination storytelling how storytelling can be healing, it can bring reconnection, and then thinking always like, you know, seven generations and beyond ahead, how does this benefit the future of the people of this earth, especially BIPOC, you know, I really come from that perspective. Um, so that's that. So, you know, through my short, but impact, I guess, but like deepening study of environmental justice storytelling, I've really thought about these four ways that it, is important and so definitely a tool for social movement. Um, you know, we all have a role to play and I think it can be really overwhelming seeing like the news and everything that's happening constantly with environmental justice. I mean, let's think about even what's recently happening with the stuff over in Ohio. And then we're seeing also, um, there was like other stuff that recently stressed me out too. There's just like so much, I can't even think about all the stuff we've seen in the news this week, right? But like, for example, that's an example right there where it's like, it might feel like, oh, there's nothing I can do. Like I have to be on the ground or even thinking back to like, when we're doing like, um, when indigenous people were pushing back on like standing rock, again, it can feel like if I don't go physically there, like I can't do anything or if I don't give money, then I can't do anything. But that's not true. I really think like we all have a role and communication is a big role because as we see, and if you were to look more into like the Ohio situation, like who is reporting them on that and like why and from where, and you'll definitely see that the people who, like the mainstream media, like the big like news channels are not reporting on it because then you'll look at the behind the scenes and you'll see who funds those reporting channels and it's people that benefit from this whole mess, right? So that's why I think like independent media, whether it's like magazine, again, podcasting, all this kind of independent, independent media that comes from folks on the ground, is so, so important. And I think like that's where like all of us can really take a part, right? Is like documenting things. And again, sometimes you don't have to be in like the physical space of the tragedy or where it's happening. We're so lucky now with like digital media, like Zoom, you can do interviews online and like other ways, right? So definitely a tool for social movement has been happening in before like the digital media era, like people would do zines, people would do flyers, like thinking back to like the civil rights movement and all these ways that people would connect with storytelling even like, you know, before we had the tools that we have now. And then I kind of started talking about this, but like archiving of lost and erased history. Again, I think about it, especially for the marginalized communities that are impacted by environmental racism. Like literally they were burning down our libraries, our like text, right? When it comes to like environmental justice leaders, like when it comes to indigenous people, like so many things happen deeply, like burned, like physically burned down, erased. We're also seeing it now with like, the critical race theory, right? Trying to ban books and things like that. Like that is all 
has a purpose of wanting to erase this knowledge, this history. And so I think same thing with environmental justice. Like if we don't archive these things with podcasting, with like, you know, like again, now we have so many forms of media that like archive things that I really think it's it's our duty to do that, you know, so that again we continue passing down that knowledge. And it just I think that's really beautiful that we can able to do that. And we're going to be documenting this climate crisis right now so that hopefully in the future, you know, we can look back and see like what it took for us to get out of this mess. Because um, I'm not about that to say stuff. I'm not going to assume that we're going to all like just not deal with this. And then disruption of hegemonic structures. So I'm sure some of you all have done, you know, your intro to environmental studies 101 type of stuff. And they make you read like. Aldo Leopold and Muir and Theo Roosevelt, all these problematic people. And why are they problematic? Because it's like a settler colonial mindset to the way that they think about nature. It's very much like we come, we conquer. I need to prove my masculinity outdoors in the wilderness. I need to put, um, like, just think about the environmental storytelling that has been told to us, right? Like, all the Buffalo massacre that happened, like, the displacement of indigenous people for national parks. Like if you read the journals of some of these men that I just listed, like it's horrific. It's really like problematic. And so again, if we're doing environmental justice storytelling or doing storytelling and documentation of the environment and of the people that are connected to the environment from a perspective of environmental justice, then we're disrupting that because like we're archiving stories of a different uh, history, right? And um, again, thinking about who's at the forefront of environmental communication, so it's still, again, a very settler uh, colonial perspective. And I do think this whole idea of like doomsday and seeing the climate crisis reported as such is super, super problematic because like realistically, the people that are gonna be most impacted by that, by this like apocalypse of like climate crisis is gonna be black and brown people. It's gonna be like poor people. It's gonna be people that are in like what we call third world, third world countries right now, right? And so, like, I don't want to hear that. Instead, I like look back at like how my indigenous ancestors have already persevered and pushed for me to be able to like be here today, wearing regalia, wearing like existing, right? If they were already, if they already went through one doomsday, which was like the start of colonialism, we can go through another one. And so I just feel like we have to see different kind of media shown about climate crisis where it's not just talking about like we're doomed, like there's no solution. Like the solutions are happening right now as we're speaking, and it can be very local, you know. Again, I definitely, I'm not going to lie to you, sometimes I get overwhelmed and I look at things and I'm like, oh my God, we're like never going to get out of this mess. But then I look at like the very small scale stuff that's happening, like even the conversations y'all are having here, like the presentations that are happening, like the new jobs that are being created, the new policies that are being passed down here in Seattle, right? Like there's a lot of movement happening that I think is going to impact at a larger scale. So again, I think the disrupting of that like notion of, like I feel like a lot of the communication also wants to like say, like, oh, like capitalism is going to end and therefore like the planet's going to end. But it's like, it's the other way around, in my opinion. <laughs> like we want capitalism to like be done, dismantle that. And then we're going to have something beyond like the end of the world, you know? Um, and then lastly, yeah, like what if instead you woke up and instead of your like social media was all this like doomsday climate crisis stuff, you woke up and you saw stories of like, like indigenous people getting their land back and being able to like, you know, use that land again and see the restoration in animals. Or we saw like stories of like black people farming and reconnecting again with the land. Like there's just so many other stories, you know, we could see in our media, in our like, I mean, in our social media feed or even like in our TV that would just give us so much more hope about the climate crisis. And then lastly, you know, healing and preservation of knowledge for future generations. So similar to the archiving and loss, again, I think like the climate crisis and everything to disrupt this idea of capitalism and individualism, we're thinking seven generations or beyond ahead. So again, the storytelling has to put in perspective, like what are the young folks doing? What are the young folks thinking? And like, how are they gonna be part of this? this um, so I'll just kind of go through the different like four pillars that I said that I've kind of worked through in my storytelling. So again, we're connecting with ancestral knowledge. So uh, like I said, I think this is really important just for the su simple survival of BIPOC and of our stories and of our people. Um, I feel like if we don't have our, like sometimes that's all we have is our stories, right? Because like, again, if they burn everything else down, then what we have is our stories to pass down and our knowledge about the environment. And that includes valuing like all forms of environmental communication. So um, I really want to show two like completely different examples that I think are really like just shows the spectrum of what we can work with, right? So I recently read the book, The Seed Keeper by Dan Wilson. I also got to interview her. So at the end, I'll share like my links for the podcast and stuff. So that hopefully will be coming out sometime in April, the interview with her. 
but this book is a fictional novel essentially right but she embedded a lot of like pieces that are actually based on real life events so she talks a lot about like the way that Dakota um that indigenous women from her community you know like would save seeds literally in their clothing when they were pushed out into the reservations when they were pushed out of their land these women were like like all we have all we can take with us are going to be seeds of this like corn of this like different like like native like plants and foods that we've eaten our whole entire lives so they sewed them into their skirts so that whenever they were going to reach the next place they were going to go to they could like rebuild an indigenous garden right and so she sewed like she put things like that she also talked a lot about like without mentioning the word Monsanto right she talked about like the patterning of seeds in her book again this is a fictional novel like all the characters are fictional but she was able to embed parts of her own story parts of her own people's history and I just really thought that was such a beautiful way to archive this like environmental knowledge of these indigenous people and like this knowledge about keeping literally keeping seeds and protecting them so that you know again a young person like in the future or right now can read this book and like from there it's just a jumping off point from learning more and becoming excited about doing this work of um seed keeping right and, and working with others around seed. So I thought that was beautiful. The other person who I'm obsessed with is Alexis Nicole Nelson, who goes by Black Forager on all her social media platforms, Instagram, Twitter, uh, TikTok in particular. And I think she's like one of the most important archivists of our time when it comes to environmental justice work, because like her videos are literally telling you how to work with plants in a way that is just like so medicinal, so practical. And again, I think like so different, right? Like they're just like little TikTok videos and some people might even dismiss it as like, oh, it's just social media, like whatever. But it's so important because like, where are we gonna find this knowledge? I mean, probably in books and such, but let's be honest, like, are we gonna more likely go into a library, look up the book, figure out how to use a plant? Are we gonna watch like a one minute, like little TikTok video her explaining? It's just like adapting to the times, right? And like. If I were like, I could just spend all day watching your videos and learning about how to take care of myself out in the wilderness. And so, again, I think there's very different, vast majority of ways that we can do environmental communication from a justice perspective, from an archival perspective that can adapt with the times and can reach a lot of audiences. So, again, two completely different spectrum of communication, but I just think they're both amazing. So thinking more about this topic of like how storytelling can be healing, I think this is more of a personal um, connection, definitely. Like I said, I think it's more about like how can this information reconnect with other parts of me? Because again, if we take away, if we look at how capitalism and the current society separates nature from a very spiritual and personal place, then we take away that part that like nature can really be healing for us and spending time with nature. So I think, you know, we can do storytelling that emphasizes that again. And so this is one of the podcast episodes I really, really liked. Like here's a QR code if you want to go directly to like listen to it on Spotify. I think it takes you to Spotify, but it's also on Apple Podcasts and all the like other places where you can find podcasts. But it was this combination track called Slowing Down to the Beat of the Earth. And I interviewed a couple different people uh, to mesh our stories together. And the idea again was that like you would just slow down, maybe go on a hike, maybe like be like paddleboarding somewhere and listen to this soundtrack or this like one hour episode of all of our stories weaving together on how we connect to the earth. And so the folks that I interviewed were like six different BIPOC uh, from the Seattle area that have some sort of connection with water. And so, and including my own, my story is in there too. And the opening is by this man, Chiyokden from the Spanish nation, which is a Coast Salish tribe. And he's also the founder of this organization called Protectors of the Salish Sea. You might have seen like his picture around and stuff. He's always like protesting things and down in Olympia, he's really cool. But it was important for me to have him open the soundtrack because he's a person from this local environment, right? And like for him to really open up that space of like the teachings that he has been given. And then we have some other like amazing black like artists and farmers who talk about their story to uh, water. And then you have myself and yeah. And then we have another indigenous woman as well. So it's just a really cool way for me to like document all of our, what we ended up calling water stories. But it also had an element of like information, right? Some people talked about like the gentrification of Seattle. Some people talked about like, again, the protecting of the Salish Sea. People talked about, there was one woman who's originally from California. So she talked about like the water, water quality stuff she saw down there and then how that influenced her journey now here at UW and the studies she did. So again, it's just a way that I found really healing for all of us to talk about our connection to water, but still be a form of environmental justice storytelling. Um, Self-determination. So this is a word that means a lot to me to put into storytelling because 
it just, I think, again, goes back to the notion of disrupting, like the, heter like the hegemonic type of storytelling. So what is self-determination? I think self-determination, the way I've been taught and see it is like the power to decide what is in our best interest. So, you know, when we talk about indigenous self-determination, that means like indigenous people get to decide what is in their best interest, either for like land management or for other things. And then same thing, you know, uh, self-determination for black people, same thing. And so, or for any group of people, right? I also think we need to be um, careful though, to think about how like, it can become very individualistic very fast. Like someone might be like, oh, I want like individual self-determination. And I think in some capacity, we can definitely say like, for example, self-determination of our bodies, right? As like women and, and, and queer folks and folks that are constantly marginalized for not being cis men, we can ask for self-determination of our bodies and we can build that. But there also has to be like a collective sense of self-determination, meaning like we have a collective sense of like, how can we collectively decide on what is for our best interest and to have again self-determination where there's not this other like governing body, like um, kind of exploiting us or creating these systems of um, violence, right? And so this idea of self-determination for me really comes from Black and Indigenous knowledge um, about, again, defending the territory. So I think back, I think about the land back movement, that is a movement for self-determination, right? Indigenous people claiming for land back for to be able to manage it properly. The Zapatistas movement down in Mexico, self-determination for the able to seeds. Uh, to be able to have, you know, again, it goes back with the seed keeper topic of like handing over seeds. Um, having, if you look into the Zapatista movement in NAFTA, you'll like find a lot of there about like the self-determination of uh, indigenous farmers back in Mexico. Again, Black liberation movements, what the Black Panthers were doing, forms of self-determination, you know, being able to sustain themselves essentially. And so for me with storytelling, when I say storytelling that's rooted in self-determination, it means I wanted to go beyond representation. Like it can be good to have like representation of stories of people of color, but who's telling their stories? Is it still a white gaze telling that story? Is it still a white like colonial framework around that story? Or is it the person you know that we're talking about, whether it's black person, indigenous person, or the person of color, are they actually getting to tell their story in their own terms? And I think that's like the trickiest part as a communicator is like, at what point do I maybe give up a little, little bit of agency over, especially if you have you know these different identities of privilege and power like how do I give that over a little bit so that the story can actually be told by the people who are you know in front of the camera in front of the whatever like whoever you're centering so I think that is like what can be the trickiest and I just you know every time I'm thinking about a story of like oh I want to interview so and so or I want to highlight so and such project again I always ask myself is it in that person in that community self it, interest of self-determination for me to tell that story or should I just literally hand over the mic and the podcast equipment and like the camera to do that you know and so I think that's something we have to ask ourselves a lot as communicators like maybe it's just not our place sometimes to tell certain stories but we can be the facilitators to tell those stories and so that's kind of what I've done with these two videos that I developed um again I'll, I'll put links for everything at the end so y'all can find this but the first one I did is called Feeding the Spirit. Um, and what I did was I interviewed folks. I was really amazed by how in the pandemic, we saw a lot of, when the pandemic started right in 2020, we saw so much bursting of mutual aid, right? Like mutual aid here, mutual aid there, like free food, free this. And that is a form of self-determination. We are self-sustaining outside of these government systems. And so I just thought that was brilliant. That was amazing. Again, a local solution that really has a big impact. And so for Feeding the Spirit, I interviewed folks that were basically doing mutual aid because of the rise of the pandemic that had to do with um, providing like organic produce to communities of color that were most uh, disadvantaged. So I interviewed uh, Roxana from Alimentando el Pueblo, which is a Latinx food bank down in Buren, who was giving culturally appropriate foods. Um, I interviewed, uh, this is Nelly and Taya from Young Women of Power. They have a little patch called Mara Farm. And that's where they work with youth of color to get them growing. And they were also giving out their produce to the youth. Um, we also did, uh, I can't forget his name right now, um, John Wesley, and he was running the Seattle BIPOC Organic Food Bank. There was also Hannah Wilson from Yes Farm. Again, they were also giving their produce. And then there was the folks from Danny Wu Community Garden, which you if you haven't been to that garden, it's super cute, international district. You like see all these awesome, like, different like Chinese and Vietnamese elders just like guarding next to each other. And again, the food was being given out for free. So this is, for me, the self-determination part there was about like, you know, I know that I could have been the narrator of that video and been like, this is what's happening in Seattle. But instead I was like, I'm just gonna sit in front of the camera, 
and let you tell me why mutual aid is important. Why do we have to feed the people? And like, what do BIPOC need? And what did everyone say to me? They were like, we need land to farm. We need land to farm in the urban Seattle. We need land to farm so we can sustain ourselves. I was like, there it is. So again, I think we can get messages across by just sometimes simply being the facilitator of that story. And then from there, I went on to do another video for the uh, Latinx food bank that I was talking about that in Deeran, Alimentando el Pueblo, or feeding the, the pueblo, the community. And what I really liked about Roxana is she said the same thing to me. She was like, I want to highlight the stories of the people that are taking this food from the food bank, but not make you like this like sad story of like, oh, we're so poor. Like we are like so disadvantaged in the pandemic, like need this free food instead being a celebration of like our community has each other. And we don't like when, you know, stuff gets hard, like who's going to be there for you? Community, community is going to sustain yourself. And so I interviewed a couple of people that went to the food bank regularly and it was like such a cute video because, you know, there was like all these like families saying like, I've been to the food banks before. I could never find things like tortillas there, like the beans that I eat. And here I am getting this whole box to stay me for like two or three weeks with all the product produce that I need, all the products that I need from the Mexican store or the other Latin American stores. And even then it wasn't just like a, here's a Latinx box. Like she split it up between Mexican, Central American and South American, which if you know anything about Latin America, that's a big deal. Cause we actually do not eat all the same things. Not everyone is eating tacos. I do, cause I'm from Mexico and I love tacos, but you know, my Central American friends and people down South might not. So it was so important for her to really distinguish that and the community really talked about that. They also said how good they felt going to the food bank. It wasn't something shameful, like they would be music playing. Give, <laughs> I've done that so many times before too. And so they would give like flowers to the people. They've had like Mother's Day celebrations at the food bank. Like again, it's a celebration of like mutual aid is not a shameful thing. Mutual aid is beautiful, mutual aid sustains us. And so again, I just felt honored to even like talk to these people and videotape that story because I was like, it's not my story to tell. I have not used that food bank personally. But I'm just happy to be the facilitator and have the platform and the vision and the storytelling to help that. So here are those two examples that I hope give across like what maybe self-determination can look like in storytelling. And then thinking about futurism and storytelling, so again, thinking long term, who are we telling stories for? Who are really like, are we like creating this story for in the platform for? And um, sorry, pulling up my nose. And so um, for me, it was just. I'll show some examples of like how I've been able to think about the future. So one uh, group of people that I've worked with is Brave Space Media. And um, they are just amazing. They're this collective of four women um, who have put together this multimedia platform to do documentaries. Uh, because if you also know a lot about, if you know anything about outdoorsy films, they're all about men doing like like you know really intense hikes like up like Mount Rainier or like up like Mount Everest and like it's very intense like I don't know it just feels like very survivor kind of vibe like I don't it just personally does not make me when I go outside it actually makes me more scared so that was like you know what they were kind of trying to push against like what if like outdoor films were not about that but rather more about like the connections the community and of course centering the voices of a black and indigenous woman because we're already there a small demographic that we don't get seen in the outdoors let alone in these documentaries and so i was one out of the 12 yeah one of the 12 women of color um, that got interviewed for this documentary and so they followed us doing different activities um, you know, I was like talking about hiking and my connection to land. There was some people who talked about like snowboarding and um, there were people talking about being like the only woman of color that they rock climb with and like all this different, like it was still like outdoorsy and we're still doing adventures, but really the essence of the film is like, I do it just simply to connect to nature. I do it simply to connect with other women. It's not about like conquering this like big obstacle, right? And of course people talked about their safety and like how is it actually being a woman of color and being in the outdoors, like how safe it is and how important it is for us to build communities like this to, um, to yeah, to just be able to like, do that like safely together. Um, and then one of the things of like why I wanted to include this example of like futurism and who are we doing this media for is because a lot of us actually talked, we got asked during the panels of the film, like, you know, like, why are you excited about this film or who are you doing this for? And a lot of us said, you know, we're doing it for our inner child that wanted to do stuff outdoors, but never saw anyone that looked like us doing it. Or maybe we're the only one. And then for our future, like children or future, like young 
girls of color that are going to see this film and be like, oh, I can also snowboard. I can also paddleboard. I can also like do this. I can also do that. Right. And like some of the women in the video do have children themselves already. And so it's super beautiful to know that like they are going to grow up with a film that says like you're a woman of color and you belong in the outdoors. So again, constantly thinking about who is this media for and who is it to serve? Uh, so yeah, the QR code takes you to the website. You can read more about the film and like request the uh, film screening and all that. And then one that I recently got to do again with Brave Space Media was actually for Eddie Bauer. This is, uh, they focused just on me. And it was really, really awesome because at first I was like, I don't know, am I becoming a sellout? Like, I don't know how to do like a promotion video. Like, I don't know, you know, like I was like, I was kind of like nervous. I was like, I don't know. But then I'm really glad I did it because I realized like, if I'm giving the platform as big as like a brand like Eddie Bauer, right, to be on their YouTube channel, to be on their social media and their website, what am I going to say? And so that I really focus on saying things like, yeah, like I want to ski if it's in their interest of self-determination. I want to ski in a native resort. I want to camp in land that's like given back to indigenous people. So I was, you know, just giving my little spiel about like land back and about liberation. And I was like, okay, hopefully they don't cut this off of the video. And they didn't. So I'm just happy that this exists where I'm like, again, the representation of it all, right? But I wanted to go beyond the representation. I'm like, I'm going to make sure I say things that I know are going to be here for like a while, right? As long as YouTube exists, it's going to be there. And so whoever sees this, I want them to know like that there is a different world that's possible and that we're building that world about like, self-determination and liberation. So, you know, it was a complicated feeling for me again of like, what does it look like to do storytelling for these brands that historically haven't always been inclusive, but sometimes you have to do that to put the little seed and just open the door so then afterwards, you know, it will just become normalized to talk about these things on this media and to show people like me. And the video, we went out camping and I was like doing my ceremony that I do, you know, when I go to a new land and like smudging and like doing all this cooking that was traditional for me and again it's like you know I think about my young self like she would have never imagined seeing a video like this of someone that looked like me talking about these things and again now there's going to be other youth uh indigenous youth from Latin America other youth of color that are going to see this and be like okay I belong in that space and I can tell my story like that one day so yeah I think that's just another example of like how I've been lucky enough to be able to do some of this work so to start wrapping it up, um, moving forward, like what can you do? What's going on? I think again, just questioning your positionality and intentions. Like again, why are you the person telling the story? And that doesn't mean you shouldn't be involved, but again, just like what should be your role? Like, should you just be the facilitator and really hand over the actual storytelling to someone else? Again, every story matters. I think all of us that have, all of you in this space are definitely unique storytellers, I'm sure in one way or another. And we're gonna need everything from like the digital media artists, right? The people that are doing the art for the stories, the people that are putting the questions, like the tech stuff, like everything, everything is so important. Um, resources, especially to youth. I say this all the time. If we can get youth a camera, podcasting, writing, like whatever it is, like they need to be at the forefront because they're the most impacted by the climate crisis. And like, you know, by youth, I mean like like younger than us, you know, we're still young people, but like younger, younger than us. So like, if you all can find ways to like mentor young people to like get them going. And again, not dismiss how like social media can actually be used for that. I think that's super important. And then lastly, you know, amplify stories that aren't featured in mainstream media channels. I mean, some of the stuff I shared is like mainstream, like the Eddie Bauer stuff on YouTube. But I think, again, there's a lot of work that is not mainstream. I love stuff that is just being done independently. I'm sure maybe you all have like a magazine here, a publication here at the college. I think that can be amplified. You can create scenes, you can create like, again, your own indie podcast. Like, I think there's just so many ways to do stories that are don't have to fit that box of the mainstream media channels. Um, and yeah, that's all. Like I promised here's like the QR code to like the website, the link, everything. If you feel, I mean, I don't expect this from you all, but if you wanted to tip in any kind of way or support the work, there's the Kofi link or copy link. But yeah, you can listen to the podcast on Apple Podcasts or uh, Spotify anywhere. Haven't been as active as much recently, but in the next couple months, there'll be some new episodes. And yeah, thank you for having me. Great, so now, thank you so much for this one. Uh, if you folks have questions, I think now would be a great time to ask. For folks online, if you have questions, you can type those in the chat. And let's just go ahead and get started with some questions then, folks. Hi. Um, did you find that like working with like Eddie Bauer and like your brands like that kind of like elevated your voice in a way that you wouldn't be able to necessarily do alone or it helped like 
foster like more resources for people to find other non mainstream media and stuff like that? Yeah, definitely. I think I like, especially because they featured it on their website. And so I was able to link things. And something I really liked about Brave Space Media, who like filmed the whole thing, was that we made a point to talk about the indigenous tribes that we were recording on. And um, from the video, we did it over in the Olympic Peninsula. And I don't know if any of y'all are Twilight fans, but you know how like there's like that stuff over there. So we literally were filming on like La Push Beach, you know? And so we talked about this and we were like, okay, people need to know like the correct indigenous people here and give them money not you know like this twilight stuff and how this was actually an, an actual indigenous tribe so that was cool that we were able to like write that in the blog post of like eddie bowers like website was like okay go donate your resources here um to this tribe where we filmed so i really liked that way to be able to amplify the indigenous people whose land we were filming on which again i don't think a lot of filmmakers do sadly yeah, question. Question. Uh, online um how do you and this might get into you. You mentioned it over the next moment you're doing some things. I don't know what projects you have going on right now, but Tia asked, "What's your what's, what's sort of what's your, what are you most excited about working on right now? What you most excited about?" Doing this year? Yeah. So the the podcast episodes that are going to release with Diane Wilson of the Seed. So I was given three books to read, and then I'm going to interview the authors of all three books. And they were all these like amazing books again about indigenous knowledge and environmental justice. So there was the Seed Keeper. The other one is The City of Dirty Water by Clayton Thompson Muller, I believe. Um, they're an indigenous activist. They're amazing. We're all going to do the interview soon. And it's, it's his memoir. And it was just so impactful for me. And then the third book, um, The Northern Lights uh, by Kasim. I can't remember his last name right now. But um, basically, I'm gonna, I got to read those three books. And now I'm getting to interview the authors. And so that should be released sometime, like April, May. I'm really, really excited. Um, because, like, again, I just think it's a different form of media. And then just manifesting right now out loud, I really think, like, TV maybe is the next thing. Like, we need some sort of, like, daily show, but environmental focus. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like we barely get any coverage about the environment in, like, TVs. And, like, like maybe we should just start, like, a talk show where we just sit and discuss the environmental issues. I don't know. I just been thinking, like, TV, TV. We need to be on TV. Just so that, again, it gets more amplified. And maybe like more with youth, you know. I want to work more with youth. That's another thing. I, like I have some stuff I know. I'm ready to give it to the youth so that they can start their own stuff. You know. Eventually, I just want to chill and like watch things. I don't want to be doing things. <laughs> I don't do real work. Yeah. I want to ask about like education because we talked about youth or like providing resources so they can like start podcasts or books or something like. That that and so how do you think like environmental education and, and like critical race theory and then you know how those things kind of intersect and how important is that for you when you go to yes so important because I, I don't know what y'all's experience, you know, you all might be from different parts of the country, but like, I feel like when we were young, we barely got anything about the climate change and climate crisis in our curriculum. I feel like at the most, it was kind of like, one day we have to kind of worry about the ozone or like one day, like, like the sea level might rise, but it was never like an immediate, like, let's do something about it now. And so I definitely think like, um, there should be more just talking about environmentalism within the like just K through 12 curriculum because again sometimes you don't get this until you go to college right and then you're like oh wow like we could have been learning about this a lot sooner um so I think that I think if we teach indigenous knowledge indigenous history in schools then we're teaching environmental education because indigenous knowledge indigenous life is, is environmental justice work and so it's in the like black history right like if y'all didn't know like the black the environmental justice movement started because of black people because of the civil rights movement so i think just making that more of a connection and of course it's going to take a lot of work because people are pushing back on like the most basic like history facts people want to teach in schools let alone talk about environmental justice going to be like how is the environment racist and then we're going to get into this whole thing but it needs to, right? It needs to be institutionalized in academia, sadly, because this is the system we work in. This is how kids learn. And so if we don't get it into the schools, then again, you don't learn until way later in your life. And I just, I feel like it can be so much harder. But I do feel hopeful because again, I, I work with a little bit of youth in like middle school, high school, and some of them started like, um, this was like down in Thurston County, but they started like these like so and so high school like earth club or like eco club and it was like so cute because like these young you know like middle schoolers and they were kind of like i'm so stressed and i was like i know but like let's think about solutions instead and they would like have me do little presentations with them and we would talk about it and like then they became really powerful and they're like we're gonna do like a what is it like the the friday strike that like students were doing and stuff and i was like yeah go for it so again i think like 
sometimes just like listening to what their concerns are. And then if you have something to offer of like, oh, I think you could use this, or have you read this? Obviously not all the literature we read about environmental justice might be like appropriate, but I think there is probably a good amount of stuff. And one I would recommend is Yes Magazine. It's local and you can still get like a copy mailed to you to your uh, mail, like mailbox. Uh, yes Magazine has articles about environmental stuff. And I think it's pretty accessible enough that like you could read that. Uh, you talked about reconnecting to your green roots. Do you have any advice for BIPOC who want to connect to their own roots? Oh, yes, that's such a, yeah, it's such a complicated journey. I think, okay, on the spiritual level, I think with the moment that I was like out loud, like, I just want to reconnect. I know I need this in my life. And then I think immediately like people started coming to me. And something I've learned in this journey is like, the universe will answer to your true self. You know what I mean? Like I could have walked around my life being like, I'm Mexican American and like this and that. But I think like the universe ultimately answers to my truest self. And I know who that is, even when like there are days of imposter syndrome. I'm like, I'm not indigenous enough. Or like, I don't, because I don't speak my language. I don't wear regalia every day, right? But I think just like, first of all, like just knowing and honoring that like my ancestors will speak through no matter what and the universe will like speak through that. So that's a little bit more on the spiritual side of things. But just on the practical side of things, I think like uh, realizing that a lot of us here in the United States, unless you're native to here, are living in diaspora, and it's actually less of a. I thought I think for a while I was like I'm the only one who feels this way, and then I was like actually no, there's a lot of us that feel this way. So I think hopefully just connecting with other BIPOC students. I don't know if like this college in particular has like an ethnic student center or has like ethnic student clubs. I was really involved in that at Western. Um, so that's one way I think connecting with organizations like EPOC, uh, EPOC Environmental Professionals of Color, that would be a really good space. Um, they're on Facebook, they have a chapter. You can already join as a student. I mean, it's a great way. That's actually how I find my job for ECOS. ECOS. It was like through them. So Environmental Professionals of Color, we do like meetings and like happy hours and socials and stuff to get to know each other. Um, and then also with reconnecting, I think just being patient with yourself that like, it's not all going to come out once. Like there might be like tidbits that you read here and then you're like, oh, like that connects to me. And then it might be months before you read something else or connect with someone else. And just like, I have to be patient with myself all the time that I'm like, I'm only 20, about to be 26. I'm only 26. I am not going to know everything right now about my family and my lineage. It's going to be a process so that one day, hopefully I will be an elder and I will get to that age and I will know something to pass down. But I'm in that path of becoming an ancestor and an elder that will know things. So you or whoever is probably on their path and that path is just going to be different for everyone. Um, I'm curious about the kind of work you do with ECOS. Um, yeah, yes. Um, so ECOS is an awesome organization. They've been around for almost 30 years in South Seattle base. It did start actually, it was white led when it started, but funny enough, it was like white folks have wanted to like make sure that like marginalized communities in South Seattle were included in like environmental decisions in the city of Seattle. And then eventually now we're actually all BIPOC led. So our executive director is a woman of color. You know, I'm up there in the senior management. All of our senior managers are people of color. So that's really amazing. And they're also people from within the community. I myself didn't grow up in South Seattle, but the majority of my colleagues, um, my coworkers are people that grew up in South Seattle, grew up in like the Rainier Valley and like South Park and that kind of thing. And basically what a lot of what we do is because we have a lot of eight languages in our organization. So we're pretty multicultural. Like we speak within our team, we speak Spanish, Vietnamese, Mandarin, Cantonese, um, Oromo, uh, Somali. Uh, we had a Korean coworker that recently left, but we've had Korean, Tagalog. So we've had like always multiple languages. Um, and what that helps is that when King County or the city of Seattle or like a department like Seattle Public Utilities or Recology is doing a contract to do outreach and they're like, we want to like make sure that these different non-English speaking communities or these communities of color get this information about like a new program. How do we do it? Then they look to us and we're like, okay, we'll do it. So then what you'll find us sometimes like tabling at events. Um, you'll find us like doing door to door, maybe reach. I know that was more before the pandemic, like door to door outreach, but now we'll mostly be at like community events or fairs. And we'll be there with a little table. We'll have materials in all these different languages. And then we are the ones kind of doing that in between like government and communities of color. Because also, like, let's be honest, a lot of communities of color are just. Uh, distressful of the government and you know rightfully so and so then they feel more comfortable having someone like ECOS and who's like a community-based organization go out to them and tell them like here like here's a way you could like 
learn about EV, it's here's a way you can learn about like stormwater, like conservation, clean water issues. And so we do that in their native language. Um, and we also do it in a culturally appropriate way in the sense of like, you know, we do it maybe in a space where it's like a cultural center, or we sometimes go to religious places because like, let's be honest, a lot of people just congregating in like religious spaces. So we'll go to like Vietnamese temples, we'll go to like mosques, uh, like churches that serve the Spanish speaking community, that sort of thing. And the last thing I'll add with that is we also love doing outdoor recreation with community. So one of my favorite projects that I manage is the Trailhead Direct. I don't know if you've heard of this service, but you basically can use the public transportation in the summer to take you directly to a trailhead over in like the, um, like uh, it's called like the Snohomish area, like over in, what is it called? Like over, I I just heard that right now. <laughs> uh, basically, we went to we went to Little Side. That's where we went last year. That's where they had the route last year. But we do those in culturally appropriate language as well. So we'll do like a Spanish speaker hike day, and then like all the Spanish speaking community, all these like you know little like grandmas and stuff will come out with us, and we'll hike together, and we'll speak in Spanish the whole trip. We'll do that one for Vietnamese as well and Chinese. And it's so cute because then the community will be like, I love this. Like I've never gone to this trail, and I got to do it with people that speak my language. And we cover their bus and we buy lunch, and it's just a really wholesome event. So we do stuff like that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I know you touched on this with um, talking about everybody's different role a little bit, but I was wondering, um, as a non-person of color, mm -hmm. how can I best respect and learn about green rooms of different people and how to like emphasize voices without intruding or appropriating on scripture? Mm -hmm. Yeah, super, super important question. I think, again, I think they're like the... The curation of like the media you consume, I think can be one that's pretty easily. So, you know, like I mentioned, like the TikToker, uh, TikToker Alexis, who's like a black, you know, person talking about like foraging. So I think it can start as simple as like that, like literally curating your, whether you use social media or you find news from another channel, like really trying to follow more creators of color, more um, like um, independent media. And I can like follow up with this with an email afterwards of a couple of like online magazines that I like to read that mostly are produced by people of color. So I think reading more stories like that can just instantly change your framework because you're suddenly seeing a different, you know, and then I think also like reading more books by folks of color. I think right now we're in an awesome time where like there's so many authors of color, like putting out amazing work, whether it's like fiction or actual like environmental justice, like reading materials, I think definitely engaging just more with that material and making that the norm versus like these historical people that are we are told are the norm, right? So I think that's one way. I think also as like white folks, you know, we do need those like allies in those bodies sometimes. So like, for example, when ECOS is doing like a fundraiser, when ECOS is doing an event, like we want to see all types of people there, right? Or we want people to like be signing up for a newsletter and hearing like what's going on and stuff like that. So I think there can be different ways where you can get involved with your organization without like making it about you or you having to be the lead, if that makes sense. I know it sounds like such a cliche response, but it really comes down to that. I feel like of just showing up, reading the material, engaging with that content. And then also something we talked about with my partner the other day, because um, he's mixed, he's white and Arab. He was saying that in some of his white, mostly white friend, like um, group chats that he has, he notices that the only articles and things that they share about the outdoors, and he has like this one outdoorsy group chat, is that they only share resources from white people and for white people, right? And so then he's like, I try to share things in there like that are more diverse. And so I think it's another thing, like in the documentary for Brave Space, um, Tazine, who's this Muslim woman, she talks about how like, if your circle is only white people, I'm not saying if your friends are only white people, you're only kind of constantly share that information within that group. So let's just like try to diverse the information you share with your friends or even if you post on your social media, so that again, like you're kind of like increasing the shareability of that, you know? So it, again, it really does come to sharing just more information and making it more mainstream. I think it really be helpful. Is that it? Yeah. Yeah, question for George and I. It actually, you know, you sort of already freshly answered this question when you were talking about some of the work that you were doing. Doing outreach in multiple ways, but in terms of your storytelling work, have you have you branched out into do storytelling with other languages being represented, uh, or is it primarily in English? Or yeah, so primarily right now it's in English. I think because I've just been most of my life right now here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, I do hope to interview more like. Um, Indigenous folks, especially and Black um, activists over in Latin America, so that I could do that in Spanish. Unfortunately, that's my only other language that I really am proficient in. 
So I'm hoping to add in some more content in Spanish, hopefully soon. But I think like whether it's for good or bad, English has kind of been a pretty universal language where I can reach people, you know, from different parts of the world. Um, and so I think right now mostly it's in English. I'm hoping, like I said, I'm hoping to do more stuff in Spanish. Um, yeah, but I, I mean, I'm open to it. I think like if I, again, so it comes to the funding, if I'm able to have funding, because I like paying people. That's another thing too I should have mentioned. Like if you can with storytelling, pay people for their stories for their time, please. So if I have funding to be able to pay me for like interpreters, I think that would be really awesome. So I would love to interview people from other parts of the world or even like native people, right? Too in their native language too. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering like how you select like which voices to amplify like do you reach out to people do they reach yeah. out to you yeah that's a good question so when I first first started the podcast it was just like my friends it was literally people I knew from my college and from my like internship I was like oh you like you're so cool like I want to interview and then as I started growing I hate like sounding like a social media like I'm always on there but it is really helpful y'all so like then on social media and it started growing I was like oh my god this person's so cool and this person's so cool and so then I interviewed people from there like for example three of my favorite episodes that I've done were on these Muslim women based in New York that are intersecting Islam and sustainability so one of them was talking about how just like literally her faith like makes her want to be more sustainable and wants to really advocate for environmental justice another person was talking about like clothing and making like modest clothing sustainable and then another person was talking about um, also like clothing and fashion how to make it sustainable again from the perspective of being a Muslim woman and they're women I've never met you know they're just like out of New York but I followed their page and I was like y'all are so cool I need to do an interview so I just reached out via Instagram um so actually yeah that's how a lot of the stuff I've done even like the brave space stuff that Eddie Bauer has just happened through social media so again if you don't want to be on social media that's fine you don't have to be but you know once in a while maybe like just browse things just to see because that's how I've been able to connect with really cool people and then now I'm really lucky that through Ecos because it's such a local based organization I've extended my network more to Seattle because I was actually reflecting on that the other day that when I was up in college in Bellingham, like, you know, when you're in college, your bubble is so small. Like, you just kind of, like, interact with students and, like, your community there. And that makes sense. You know, you're kind of in that time in your life. So I feel like for a while I was very, like, focused on what was going on in Bellingham. And then when me and my partner moved back this way, I was like, okay, I didn't know what's happening in Seattle. So now I just, like, really try to prioritize, like, connecting with Seattle-based organizations. Like, Yes Farm, who's part of the Black Star Farmers Collective here in Seattle. Uh, with the indigenous people here, I try to go to a lot of events at the Daybreak Indian Center, which is over in like uh, Discovery Park. They have a lot of like local events. Y'all should definitely go to that. Uh, we connect with the like, Duwamish tribe, the Muckleshoot tribe, that kind of thing. So, yeah. uh, a question from online. Mm -hmm. uh, this this uh, student was curious about getting into storytelling uh, and sort of. How how would you advise them to get into yeah. this as a yeah. practice? I can think of two different paths. One, they are actually, I've seen a lot more like environmental justice, like communication fellowships out there. And I'm a big fan of fellowships. We're kind of talking about this earlier. Like if it can get paid and you can get experience while getting paid, that is like the prime. And so sometimes like that's what I would do is I, I, I'm one of those people who applies to everything because I'm like the worst case scenario they say no to me, but the best case scenario, I end up in like any power video, you know? So I just apply to everything. And so if you just one day are like environmental justice fellowships, you will actually find quite a few. One of them who has like a reporter one is Grist, like G-R-I-S-T. They're like an online platform and they have a fellowship every year where you apply and you get to like report on environmental justice issues. And I think they have other stuff that's not environmental justice, but still climate related. Um, Indian country also had, or yeah, but basically if you look up like environmental justice fellowships um, or internships, you can find a couple out there. There's a lot more now that exist um, where it gives you an opportunity to experiment with just local storytelling and then you get paid to do that, you know, and they'll pay you, they'll be like anything from like, 800 to a thousand word maybe article they're asking you to do like every couple months um and so that's a good way to start just literally like throw your, go in there and go more of that traditional route of getting experience like that but uh, the other way I would say is like I think it does help to be niche I think that's where I'm trying to do with Raices Verdes I think when I started I was very broad I was like oh the BIPOC stories and I'm like wait that's a lot of people and that's a lot of things I don't know so let me like narrow it down so I think lately my focus has been more on my own personal journey of connecting to my indigenous roots and, and like interviewing a lot of indigenous people that are going through similar experience 
And so I think it is good to find your niche, whether it's like maybe you're really into like zero food waste or like the fashion stuff, or you're really into like urban guard, uh, urban gardening or transportation. Like I think it can help to just maybe like zone in a little bit to help with that communication. And then from there, I think thinking about your platform, your media channel is really important. Like I guess you can tell I enjoy talking out loud. I enjoy being in a public setting. So I was like, podcasting sounds fun. Like I always wanted to be on a radio show. But maybe for someone that wouldn't be the most comfortable setting, right? Maybe the writing and behind the screen is better. Maybe it's photography. Maybe again, it's like maybe you're really good at TikTok videos. Like maybe that's your platform. Um, what else? It could be also like zine making. It can be also like hosting like round tables like this, you know? So I think just finding also your ch- like media channel and not thinking again, you have to eat the whole world or really just pick one, I think can really help. And then from there, I think just start building it. Maybe it's for yourself first. Maybe you just share it with your like close friends, social media, then you actually put it out there. Maybe you share it. I also think school is a great way to experiment. Like if in your capstone, you have an opportunity to do something creative, be like, I'm going to figure this out. And then that's how I started the podcast. It's like, I'm just going to figure it out. And another thing, if you, any of y'all are ever curious, I do put myself out there as a resource. Just email me and I can give you all resources on how to start a podcast. I like how to like figure it out and put it on Spotify and all that. It actually, it doesn't cost anything, believe it or not. Where it comes in handy to have money is for like equipment and stuff like that. But all this stuff is actually for free. So just message me and I can let you know like where to start stuff. Well, great. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, I can hang around for a little bit afterwards. Uh, thank you so much. We really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you and say good night. So have a good night.